7 p.m. So not to keep you much longer than that. Uh, I think we're going to start our event. Thank you for everyone for joining us. We're the Public Health Society. And tonight we're very pleased to have uh, Professor Martha Clocky to speak to us about antimicrobial resistance. As some of you may know, uh, for the past few days and until I think the end of the week, it's the uh, Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week. And so we thought it would be very relevant to host a talk uh, about the topic as it is uh, one of the biggest public health challenges we'll have to face. And so to try to raise awareness about the topic and who better than our very own Professor Clucky from the University of Leicester was doing pioneering research on, I believe, uh, bacteriophages as alternatives to antibiotics, which I'm really excited and looking forward to hear about uh, later on. So I'll give the floor on to you. Hello. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really, um, this is the perfect audience to talk to. People who are <laughs> about to be, make a big difference in the health profession. So I'm very happy to share with you um, my research and insights over the last couple of decades. I'm going to share my presentation with you, at least. I shall try to. Okay. No. Okay, can you see the um, the slides okay? Yes. Okay, great. So what I, um, I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit about why I think that viruses of bacteria are going to be really important in our um, next set of tools that we can use to fight antimicrobial resistance. So to do that, I'll first of all tell you a little bit about some of the problems associated with antimicrobial resistance and why we need alternatives. And I'll tell you quite a bit about phages. I'll talk about uh, their history, when they were found, a little bit about the biology so you can understand that it's, it's not totally trivial to develop them. Um, and then importantly, I want to talk about some work that we're doing um, at Leicester, which is a really nice partnership between uh, myself as a phage biologist with a, a, a clinical um, lecturer and with a public health doctor because at the moment we have a situation where we have um, doctors and regularly contacted by different types of doctors who have got patients who are dying due to bacterial infections and then you have people like me who try to develop bacteriophages but I can't easily give my phage collections to um, to uh, doctors to treat their patients at the moment we need to get clinical trial evidence which is what we're trying to do to bridge that gap so I'll talk about why I'm focusing on specific areas. OK, so that's the sort of overall um, shape of my presentation today. And I hope you like this uh, first uh, figure I have. It is a beautiful sculpture that was made by a ceramic artist called Amy Lax, and she made this from some of my pictures that I took on the electron microscope. And what you can see here in yellow is a bacterial cell. And all of those little rather sort of ethereal looking phages are viruses that infect that cell. And what's happened is one of them is already successfully infected. It's taken over the whole of the, uh, the, the transcriptional and translational machinery of that bacteria, it's turned it into a viral replicating machine, and it's released a uh, several uh, tens of bacteria phages from it. So that's what bacteria phages do. They specifically infect bacteria and they are highly specific. So a bacteriophage that infects an E. coli, for example, won't infect a Clostridium and so on. So they're very, very specific. So one of these, these phages has already sort of um, <laughs> successfully managed to infect and take over that cell and release small viruses, which will then find more of their bacterial hosts. So when I say phage, I do just mean uh, bacterial virus. Uh, phage just means eater. Bacteriophage, obviously bacterial eater. So you may have seen, if you're um, at all interested in uh, infectious diseases and alternatives to antibiotics, headlines such as this, because currently the use of phages is really capturing imaginations worldwide. And I thought I'd show this case as my first slide because it's based um, in the UK. So here was a young girl who had cystic fibrosis. Uh, she had a lung transplant and unfortunately the lung was contaminated with a mycobacterium abscessus infection. So she was given a 1% chance of living. The infection became systemic. 
But luckily, her mother had heard of bacteriophages and, well, perhaps even more luckily, uh, the hospital that she was in, which is Great Ormond Street, uh, had quite forward thinking physicians. So this is the, the, the doctor that treated her. And she uh, contacted this chap here who's a specialist in America in mycobacterial phages. And they found her some phages and um, they were able to save her life. However, it is not widely available as a treatment. I'll talk about where it is later on in my presentation. So why do we need bacteriophages? Well, it's predicted that unless we do something, by 2050, there will be a staggering 10 million people dying of an antimicrobial resistant infection every year. So to put that into context, this is about, um, it's predicted that, that about 5 million people have died across the globe due to COVID infections. I'm sure it's much higher. But um, just imagine twice that number um, every year due to infections that can't be treated. We can see these are the areas that the infections are most likely to, um, or the most numerous in Africa, Southeast Asia. They will also be highly problematic in Europe and North America, um, everywhere, really. So it's totally essential to do something and people like uh, Sally Davis who was the former chief government medical advisor have been very very active in, in really making people much more aware uh, of, of this future um, sort of dire situation because what we have is this, it's almost a perfect storm we know that in general if you look at any bacteria whether it's here's just a, one particular graph from one particular hotel whether it's e coli Klebsiella, whatever the bacteria is, we know that year by year, the amount of antibiotic resistance is getting greater and greater. So this is um, as counted by the amount of uh, strains that are not sensitive to standard antibiotics that are available to our doctors. Uh, meanwhile, we have a very few um, new drugs coming onto the market. So the anti-infective space is very unconducive for investment for biotech uh, companies and pharmaceutical companies, a lot more resource goes into uh, drugs that can be taken for more than just a week. So you have increasing resistance and a decreasing amount of tools available. So what I hope to convince you today, my talk is not too doom and gloom, I don't think. I'm hoping to show you that there's another set of tools we really haven't investigated very much that I think will be useful to us if we just can figure out how to use them. So what is the relevance to patient care in, uh, in terms of not having antimicrobials? There, there, are, there are many things that will happen. One is that vulnerable patients uh, in need of any type of surgery will just die from a, a, an infection uh, that they pick up. So they'll perhaps get opportunistic, opportunistic infections. For example, in post-op surgical patients, they'll, they'll find that you'll find um, Infections from the, the chest, uh, for example, uh, chest, gut, skin translocations. So bacteria falling in from the skin is very common. Um, uh, you can also be infected in hospitals by what's known as, you've pro probably heard of these escape pathogens. So these are largely gram negative pathogens. I've listed them here. So it's Enterococcus, Staphylococcus, Klebsiella, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas and Enterobacter. Um, these pathogens are all um, documented as becoming more and more aggressive in terms of their ability to uh, either neutralize or um, chuck out antibiotics. So they're becoming more and um, far less effective. Uh, and plus there's going to be people acquiring opportunistic infections in, in other settings. So we're using antibiotics so widely in, in humans. Um, so in, our country, in, in the UK we have pretty tight um, restrictions over what antibiotics can be prescribed and there is a big effort to try to reduce them. But this is not the same in other places. So if you go anywhere, I've been to, with my phage work, I've been all over the place to different countries where you can just buy antibiotics really easily over the counter and people just buy them all the time and don't use them correctly. So they use them sort of like half a course or something and they share it amongst the family. So you're really breeding resistance. And plus another um, aspect is we, we, we generate resistance very often in the in the food chain. So we still treat animals with antibiotics. 
So we build antibiotic resistance in an animal setting. And then once those bugs are established, they travel. So if you're traveling abroad, <laughs> you're probably, probably my, my microbiome is full of not very nice things. Luckily at the moment, not causing me um, any harm. But, um, and, but, and, and also through, through, through the food we eat. So most of the work I'm talking to you about today is about using phages to treat humans. But I have another side of my work where I use phages to treat animals. And the idea is a sort of one health approach. We can minimize the amount of AMR we build up in our animals. So you reduce transmission into humans. We really don't want to have a world where we return back to the dark ages and we can't treat people that we need to be treated for fear of infection. So it's important to understand the sort of context that we'll be releasing phages or new other microbials in, um, in order to reduce the global burden of AMR infection. And I took this figure from the um, Public Health England's guide to um, AMR monitoring. So I think what we have got now is a much better understanding um, about the relationships between health and social care, environmental contamination. We understand a lot more now about the, the, our microbiome and um, how that relates to clinical disease. But there are more studies going into all these different areas. We're also trying to understand better um, the molecular aspects of well, where, are, where, where are these AMR genes coming from and how are they being spread within bacteria. People are also looking for studies to try to break cycles of transmission. And there's a lot of projects really to try to understand AMR. It requires very, very multidisciplinary projects between disciplinary projects, between academics, uh, clinicians and industry partners. Clearly, we need more trials to actually get new drugs to market as well. So it's that sort of overall general space that we're, we're bringing in new antimicrobials into this greater awareness. OK, so why are phages going to be a good part of the puzzle? Well, they're really specific. So in comparison to an antibiotic, which will generally uh, kill at least an entire species or probably many related species of bacteria, Phages are specific to that species or even to a subspecies. So you can find phages, for example, that will just kill a certain type of E. coli. So therefore, when you use a phage treatment, you will just remove that one thing that is causing a massive problem. You won't damage the rest of the beneficial microbiota. Often people feel sick when they take antibiotics because they've killed that commensal flora or microbiota that they need. So phages are going to be useful for antibiotic resistant bacteria, and also to preserve our last line antibiotics. So where they use phages, for example, in Georgia, I'm lucky enough to have been there several times, they will use phages in hospitals to treat chronic infections and they'll preserve the antibiotics for acute infections. Another really good use of phages is to treat biofilms. So often infections occur within a, a sort of a biofilm where the bacteria secrete a really hyper gloopy surface consisting of proteins and sugars and um, DNA gets caught up in there. And it just means that antibiotics can't penetrate. So even if they're still working, they won't be able to get into that bacteria to kill the infection. Whereas phages make enzymes, which can indeed penetrate. So they can be useful there. Also, there are areas in the body that are fairly difficult to access with the antibiotics, such as the bladder. So a phage is good because you have a self-replicating medicine at the site of infection. So our bodies are, are used to phages as well, so we don't mount a strong immune response, particularly if they're taken um, orally or uh, topically or they're nebulized into the lungs. There's plenty of studies have now shown that we don't mount an immune response to this. And I, I think this is really important, my last point, that, that phages exist, okay? So bacteria are 3.9 <laughs> billion years old, and you can find antibiotic resistance um, actually way back, it's an, it's an old phenomenon because it's it's part of, um, most antibiotics are, are, are for the products of other fungi or bacteria. So um, in natural bacterial warfare, <laughs> bacteria find all sorts of ways of, of, of stopping stuff, killing them. So that antibiotic res antimicrobial resistance exists, but we've just really precipitated it by using those compounds. But in this mixture, <laughs> there are also these natural viruses that can kill the bacteria. So they, they exist already and they've been far less um, studied than 
have antibiotics. So why is that? And if phages are so good, why are we not using them already? Well, um, this specificity is also a disadvantage. So I said it was really good because it kept the rest of the microbiome intact, but it does mean you need to know what you're targeting. You can't just give a random phage. You need to make sure it's sensitive. So phages for some bacteria are quite hard to find, isolate, propagate. In my lab, for some reason, we specialise in finding phages for these really hard things. Um, now, they are they're biological things, so you need to... Um, you need to stabilise them and you need to basically be able to give them um, to bacteria when the bacteria are in a certain physiological state. So also they're a bit more complicated to be uh, given out. There's not much data on actually how you will formulate them, what the dynamics of treatment are. So you can imagine it's very, very different to your standard pharmacology, um, plus delivering them as well. There are differences to delivering a phage to an antibiotic. Now, the regular regulatory, regulatory arena is often given as being the one major thing, and it, it is difficult. They're, it's, they're hard. The regulators um, don't really know how to regulate phages because they're so different to a standard antibiotic, but they are being really helpful in telling us what kind of data we need. So we're making progress there. So where, where did I decide to focus in my research? Well, over the last few years, I have focused on looking at the bacteria that are most commonly found as uh, causing bloodstream infections. So in the UK, we've got the numbers here, 65,000 AMR infections were seen in 2019. Um, so that was an increase from 2018. And the most common infection is E. coli, um, which is, carrying, is, is, is rising. Um, and AMR bloodstream infections have actually risen by a third since 2015. And um, AMR within these um, is linked to one in five people with a, with a key bloodstream infection. So half of these bloodstream infections are caused by um, actually an underlying urinary tract infection. So that is quite um, uh, key because what I would like to try to do with my work is try to treat these urinary tract infections, okay, because if you want to treat a bloodstream infection, you have to use phages systemically, which will be possible, but it's even more complicated than using them um, in other ways. So what I decided to focus on with one big strand of my work was trying to reduce these bloodstream infections by treating the urinary tract infections for these reasons. Now, um, yeah, this is just showing you here. Um, the number of infections that's going up. You can see, so this is incidence of bloodstream infections caused by key pathogens per 100,000 population in the whole of England. So we can see it's going up in E. coli, it's going up in um, Klebsiella and pneumonia. So these are the two that we focused on. So urinary tract infections themselves are a significant case of morbidity. Um, as I said, 50% of sepsis comes from them. And also there's a growing problem now. If you talk to doctors working in um, in hospitals where they're looking after elderly patients, there are, particularly with catheters, it's really common for catheters to get infected, and it's largely with these two bacteria. Um, so there's a growing problem of, of AMR within these most uh, commonly found bacteria, both with E. coli and Klebsiella. So what we're trying to do is ultimately we'd like to do a, a clinical trial on UTIs in order to treat this disease and then reduce sepsis. So I'll tell you the steps that we're going to do that. I'll come back to this, but I wanted to tell you that's where we're focusing. But now I feel I need to tell you a little bit more about phages and how they work. Now I'll do that by this rather nice video which is showing you, this demonstrates really nicely the specificity of phage and bacteria. So the, whether or not they can infect or not depends on, can you see these tail fibers coming down? So whether or not they find the right receptors depends whether it will infect. So this is find the right receptors. So now the secondary receptors are deployed. Um, and did you see that the bottom of that sheath of the phage is, is contracted? Um, and the, the DNA is then coming from the head of that phage through the bacterial cell wall, through this tube into the bacteria. So that's how they work. And I really like that video because it's based on about 20 years of quite hardcore uh, physical biology and biochemistry to, to, to figure out exactly how those phages are doing it. 
Um, pages are really, really, really numerous. So it's estimated that there is about 10 to the 13 viruses uh, on Earth. Um, and this picture captures uh, that. What this picture is showing is um, a sample of seawater that's been stained with a cyber green stain. And can you see those large particles? They're all bacteria. And all the little tiny ones are phages. So it's estimated that each bacteria in existence has about between 10 and 100 phages that target it. And in my lab, I've largely focused on particular ones. That wizening bacteria was a Clostridium difficile. So this is still, um, there's still a desperate need to try to treat patients with, with C. diff. We've only got two antibiotics that are effective. Um, these next three pathogens are all different respiratory pathogens. So Streptococcus pneumonia, um, um, Moraxella, and um, Haemophilus. And then we've got um, Salmonella, Klebsiella, and also I've been working more recently on Lyme disease as well. So that's caused by, um, it's carried by ticks and they, and, and the ticks carry these Lyme disease, these spirochete bacteria. So each system you work on, when you work with phages, you have to find those. I told you there's like 10 pages or 100 for each bacteria that's out there, but finding, finding them and bringing them into isolation um, is not always easy. So I thought I'd just show you what I do, because otherwise it's always my first question. Like, where do you get those phages from? You say there's lots, but where are they? Um, this is where they are. You have to go to where your bacteria are found in the wild. So here we have a large pile of horse muck, which in which this is a great source of sampling for both E. coli and Pseudomonas. Um, here we have a um, excited child, that's my older child a few years ago, um, and is in an anoxic mud flat in Hampshire. So Clostridium difficile is a anaerobic gut pathogen and Unfortunately, by the time it's causing disease in us, it's escaped and we have its phages, but naturally in the environment, in very smelly and oxic mud, I can find phages for it. Um, so this is a, a sampling of water. Sometimes we do sample in nice places. This is some of my students sampling for a project in Kenya. And these are actually some students from the lab. Maybe some of you may recognise this lovely environment of Bragate Park. Um, because there are deer there, there are ticks. So we we're uh, drag netting to find ticks, to find phages associated with them. So you go to the environment where your bacteria are abundant and um, you try to find phages. Now, unfortunately, unlike the situation with botany, so I have a strong uh, uh, enjoyment really of studying botany and plants. And I know if I want to study um, specific environments like the chalk, grass chalklands, I just need to go to the environment, open the book and I can figure out what all the plants are because that, that book is written in decades of study of botany, have told us what these things are and how they work. But within phages, it's all very new really. We, we haven't still got much of a picture as to even if I knew <laughs> uh, which environments to really hunt, I wouldn't be able to target specific ones. So part of my work um, is about trying to uh, really understand where bacteriophages are found in the wild for us to be able to then bring those into cultivation. And then when we bring them into cultivation, what we do is we look for their killing. So can you see on this plate, can you see that's um, evidence of phage killing? You can see what, what's happened here is one phage has gone in, it's replicated and replicated and replicated, and you can see a good um, set of clearing on that plate. Um, you can see this is a bacterial culture growing, and that's when you've added phages, it's cleared it completely. But not all phages are equal. <laughs> it's in the same way that some viruses make us sicker than other viruses. Some phages, you can see that phage has killed some bacteria. If we look at the, this is the amount of um, colony forming units of bacteria with time. So that phage has, has lowered it to some extent, whereas this phage has killed everything. So what we try to do with our work is find those more aggressive phages. Always look at their morphologies. I love doing this part always, looking to see how they look under the microscope. And we look at their genomes uh, to check they haven't got anything in their genomes that might make them worse when we use them as a treatment. And then to try and understand them, we do various things to look at their proteomes as well and also other levels. So we look at their transcriptomes uh, and their um, metabolomes. So it's quite, you can see with phage biology, it's everything from guddling around in fairly nasty environments to doing quite careful microbiology to hardcore molecular biology um, and through actually into protein structure. So you have this sort of all this all of this stuff sort of underpins the conversation that we have to find the right phages that we can then talk to uh, people like you who'll, who want to be able to use them in patients. Um, 
So we spend quite a lot of time with them figuring out which phages work well together. So we call this a phage cocktail. So we put together, some phages work nicely together and some will block each other. Uh, it's always important to find phages that kill as much as you can within a species. So what you can see here, if you look at this pie chart, that's just showing, this is actually a salmonella. So the, the salmonella that circulate in the UK are, are just, these are the different common serovirus shown in the big cut in these big colours. So phages uh, that we want to use would have to be able to kill all of these different types of salmonella and preferably these as well. So um, we spend a lot of time making sure phages have got the right host range. Now this weird and wonderful diagram on the right side, I really love. <laughs> it's it's basically a, um, a schematic to tell you um, different groups of how uh, all of the phages that target that organism. So these are actually all, each dot is a phage that targets a salmonella and you have groups of completely unrelated phages. So like here, the size of the dot reflects the genome. We can see that this group of phages is totally not related at all to this group and uh, not related to that group. But that, there is some similarity there between the phages within those two groups. So we spend a lot of time looking at the genomes of phages because the idea is that if they are different to each other, they're probably killing that bacteria differently, which means that when you can combine them, you'll get less problems with the buildup of phage resistance. So we spend an inordinate amount of time um, trying to figure them out from the molecular point of view. We then have to see how they work. So these are the graphs I showed you before. We then have to show how they work in animals. So this was some C. diff data. We could see that when I fed the hamsters with, um, with phages, uh, the amount of C. difficile that you find in the cecum of the, or, or sorry, in the, um, in, in the colon of the hamster completely it is significantly reduced. So this is in terms of a log reduction. And this particular combination of phages was the most effective. And then we also showed when we gave phages to the hamsters, we can uh, double their life expectancy in a challenge model. So you might think, well, half, well, you know, so they still died, but the hamsters are actually, they're not a brilliant model. They're better than mice because mice aren't sensitive to the C. diff toxins, but hamsters are, but they're really, really sensitive. So this kind of a difference is comparable to what you'd see from antibiotic. So we spend, um, you can see that we have to show that they work in just in, in flasks and in vivo settings, um, sorry, in vitro settings, and then we have to use animals to show how they work in a much more realistic environment. Okay, so I thought you might like to see a few more <laughs> morphologies of viruses. So these are a whole bunch of different viruses that we've isolated recently. And I want to make really the point that you can see that they fall into different groups. So these, there's one set that look like this. These are called podos, podo meaning feet, um, podoviruses. So they don't have a big long tail. You see, these are like the ones I showed you in that movie with a contractile tail. Um, and then we see ones with a long um, non-contractile tail. So there are certain morphologies of, of, of phages and we know a little bit about different types of behaviors that are associated with that. But there's um, huge amounts of this novel diversity. So you can have phages that look identical to each other, like they do in that diagram, but they'll have no <laughs> nothing in common. And what that graph on the left is showing you is um, the blue is, is, is an estimate of the distance between all known bacteria in blue, and then in red is, is, is a genetic distance between all phages. So you can see that over their evolutionary trajectory, they've really evolved very different ways of killing bacteria. So I think that's quite hopeful as a plot because it shows that if we can find these phages, and figure out how they kill, we can we can use them to uh, target the pathogens we wish to. So the interest in phage therapy is growing. We can see these are all the uh, um, papers from 1940s till a present day that mention phage therapy in them. And I've, I've seen that shift of interest myself. So I came to Leicester in 2007 and my colleagues, particularly my clinical colleagues, said, well, you know, you can study these phages and figure out that cool biology, but, you know, don't ever use them or say you want to use them. Now my lab is um, you know, flourishing, shall we say. We've got a lot of, uh, a lot of interest for many um, different areas in terms of trying to develop this technology. And that, I should say, actually, that that interest in terms of um, number of papers is also reflected in, in terms of um, funding and um, uh, both from research councils and from industrial funding as well. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. 
Now the history of phages is, is really fascinating. Um, I'm just going to condense it down to two slides that essentially were discovered over 100 years ago by, you would be pleased to know, an Englishman called Frederick Twart. Uh, he found them in 1915, but sadly for him, the, um, the war got in the way and he did write up his experiments in The Lancet, uh, where he said, um, I hope you find my observations useful. But sadly, he couldn't go back to this research. Um, I did meet his granddaughter, which was a great privilege. <laughs> he was telling me lots of stories about, about the sort of the sadness really in the family that he couldn't go back to that work. However, this chap, Felix Sturel, he was a completely maverick French Canadian who co-discovered phages a couple of years later. And he did go on and um, develop them to treat all sorts of different types of bacterial infection. And he wrote his first book on phages exactly 100 years ago. So you can see this technology is not new. It predates antibiotics by a fair whack of time. But unfortunately, um, probably for humans, <laughs> it was thought that antibiotics were just so much simpler. So after the 1940s, when antibiotics were discovered, they were developed and most phage therapy work was sort of it, it, it was stalled and said phages were used as molecular biology tools. So lots and lots and lots of things we understand about uh, molecular biology, even things as basic as the fact that DNA is our, uh, is our genetic material. That was shown by doing phage experiments. Um, the fact that three different uh, amino acids encode for um, uh, are needed to um, Sorry, three different nucleotides are needed to make one amino acid. Again, that was shown with phages. So, and then a lot of enzymes that we use routinely in uh, molecular biology, again, it's all, have all come from phages. So they were used very much as tools to understand that. Um, however, they did remain being made in the Pasteur Institute for a good, um, for many de decades, at not at a particular high level, but they were made until the 70s. Now, if you know something about phages, you might think they're a kind of, um, they're a sort of Eastern thing. And that connection was the fact that there's a young Georgian scientist called George Eliava. He trained with Felix Sorrell here in the Pasteur Institute and he took that technology back with him. And at his, in the heyday, they were making uh, hundreds of tons of phages per year. It was being distributed all throughout the uh, former USSR to treat many uh, things like diarrhea and gangrene. And they're still used in clinical practice today. So this is actually this is where all phage biologists love to go to this building. This is um, uh, <laughs> this really nice phage research still goes on to this day. And just around the corner is a pharmacist where you can still buy phage preparations. Sadly, this is a little by the by. This is how there's a terrible story really with associated with lots of uh, tragic story with phages, and that George Eliava fell in love with the wife of the uh, head of the secret police and was executed by Stalin. So sadly, um, <laughs> uh, Felix Durrell never went back to Georgia after that. So anyway, fortunately, in a way for the Georgians, they'd already established this institute and they carried on working in it. So how are phages used? Actually, I could even show you now I'm actually at home. I've got in my fridge vials of, of, of phages like this. This is how the Georgians prepare them. Um, and they have in there, to get over the specificity problem, they'll have six different um, phages that target six different important bacteria. They have a skin preparation and internal preparation. So they, they're complex, really, really complex mixtures of phages in the hope that some of those phages will target that thing that you're interested in doing and then will replicate. Um, you can use them orally, topically. You can use them, can you see here, you can use them as, as dressings. Um, and you can use them in association with good good surgery as well. Oh, and I've got loads of data. I don't want to go into it now, but I'll happy to take questions or talk more. If you use them prophylactically, they're really, really good. You can actually prevent infections forming. So I'll show you uh, three examples now of where phages have been used to, on, on patients. So this is now data from a, a Texan friend who is running a wound clinic. I sent my cousin here actually, he had to do his, he was doing his medical degree and he wanted to do something interesting for his, um, <laughs> for his you know, year where you can, um, like intercalated year. So he wanted to go and do something uh, for his elective rather. And uh, off he went to this clinic and really found it very fascinating. But this is a, a diabetic foot ulcer. Um, it's been infected by a multi drug resistant pseudomonas. This patient was obviously, was also um, clinically depressed this horrible wound that hadn't healed for two years. 
you can see that with phase treatments, it formed um, epithelial, island, epithelial islands within the skin and healed up really nicely. Next case I wanted to mention was a case that became quite a well-known case in page biology. It was a um, Canadian jazz musician who had a bone infection. And this is, there was, he sadly, he died just recently, but there was a brilliant surgeon uh, in Georgia um, who trained lots of other young surgeons uh, called Goran Gashvalia. And he, um, he operated on this man and they perfused phages around the infected uh, bone and they were able to, to treat the infection. So the infection wasn't actually resistant to antibiotics, but you just couldn't get antibiotics to it. So the phages worked well there. And the final set of images I'm showing you are fairly gruesome, but they illustrate the power of using phages to um, save a limb. So when I saw, again, this is Georgian data, but when I saw it presented, the, um, as an American surgeon said, the, you would not have tried to save an arm like that. But the way they used phages here was to prevent any infection. So this is a, um, an arm that was uh, really badly blown apart in a mine explosion. You can see the wounds, really, really horrible. But they, they, they um, use phages to prevent infection and it healed up nicely in the end. OK, so there are centres where phages can be accessed around the world. There's several in America. I work quite closely with this person in my chair. I work with a charity called Phages for Global Health, where we teach phage technology to African academics, mainly medics, vets and food microbiologists. And we've done one four workshops now. And I work with this chap, he, but he works a lot in Yale University with someone called Jonathan Koch, and they've mainly been treating cystic fibrosis patients. They're allowed under American um, sort of regulation to, to treat patients who are um, who can't be treated. So they, they, those infections will be completely drug resistant, in which case they're allowed to use phages. And they actually use phages in a very cool way because they, they use them on these antimicrobial resistant infections, but they specifically use phages that target the efflux pumps, so the pumps and the bacteria that pump out the antibiotics. So the only way for the bacteria to become resistant to the phages is to change this efflux pump, which means that they're then resensitized to the antibiotics. So I think you can see going forward, there's going to be lots of clever ways we can use phages when we understand that biology. So with what he's doing with his patients is they're using phages, which is knocking back the infection and then finishing off the treatment back again with the antibiotic treatment. And they've saved, it's not huge numbers, but they treated about 60 patients and um, saved the majority of them. And the ones that have died had, had other sort of comorbidities. Okay, so where is phage therapy today? As I said, it's used quite a lot in Georgia, Russia, Poland. There's huge amounts of um, resource now going into this technology. And there's an increasing amount of compassionate cases being uh, where it's being investigated. Um, phages have in the states the status called GRAS status, so generally recognised as safe. Um, you can buy products that have got phages in them to prevent, for example, hysteria. And uh, there's an increased interest as well. In, I was in Europe and in North America, there's probably more interest in human phage therapy, although some interest in animals as well. And in Southeast Asia, there's huge amounts of interest in terms of fish farming, shellfish farming, um, aquaculture and crops as well. So um, especially there's, you can find phages for the bacteria that cause crops to rot. So actually you can buy, um, if you buy your potatoes in Tesco or Sainsbury's uh, or Waitrose, they most likely will be covered in a, in a phage spray, um, which is used just to, to, instead of chlorine, to stop bacteria rotting those potatoes. So we do use them in some aspects of food production already. So the question that always gets asked at the end of a, phage meeting or some stage within a, <laughs> a meeting is, how should you use phages? Would you have them as a kind of compound pharmacy? Um, so would you respond to these infections that patients have and isolate their bacteria and therefore um, get their perfect phage combination? So the advantage of doing that is you'd have a nice fresh preparation, you'd know your phages are active and you can very specifically target that pathogen of interest. Or is it better to have a sort of off-the-shelf option? So very similar to how doctors use antibiotics, they can just go to the shelf and find a, you know, a specific combination of phages that they know will target that disease. So this is cheaper, they can be standardised, quality check regulated, 
And it's, so it's easier to fit that into standard practice. So there are pros and cons of both approaches, and it always ends up in a kind of bun fight with uh, the companies that are doing one attacking <laughs> or not attacking, having quite strong opinions about why what they're doing is correct. Um, so these are a few companies that are um, pursuing these off the shelf pages. Um, there is CD Spammer. They actually, they were like the, the go to um, phage therapy company that was doing a human trial. Um, in Europe a few years ago, they they got wasn't a huge amount of money. It was it wasn't it was a fair. It was it was a few two or three million euros. But unfortunately, um, they they made several technical errors in terms of the way they designed the trial, and it it, it failed. It's not uh, I could talk about it a lot more. Um, I don't want to go into the details uh, uh, and a lot of information at this stage. But essentially, it, it failed due to not understanding the phages that were being used. Um, there's also been trials where there's a, a company called Armata um, in, in Los Angeles. This is a, a company that's been formed from several other phage companies that endlessly sort of going bankrupt and buying each other up because it's a, as I said, the anti-infective market is quite harsh. Um, they've been doing some quite good work on um, treating patients with uh, staph um, induced bacteremias or sepsis. And they're going to be also doing some work on um, uh, doing some proper trials in this space. They're also using engineered phages or, or they have also a program to look at engineered phages. So you don't have to use phages as they are naturally, you can also change them, but this does also make their regulatory, um, <laughs> not just regulating them more complicated. There's another company called Intralytics uh, and they are mainly commercializing products for use in food and um, also involved in other clinical trials in humans, particularly focusing on inflammatory bowel disease. So companies that are looking at the other type of phage preparation, where they've got a, a specific, um, they'll make a specific product to the person, are companies like Adaptive Phage Therapeutics. They have just won a massive uh, grant from the American Army to, um, uh, to look at um, particular types of infections. There's also Locus Biosciences, uh, they're a company doing that. They, they've, they've been working on UTIs. Um, and then there's a company in Israel called Biomix, which is making quite good progress looking at, um, again, these um, uh, compound or engineered um, phages. So the larger companies are coming to phage meetings and are doing things, Merck are interested. And amusingly, yeah, there's a man, <laughs> this man from Amazon keeps coming to all the phage meetings and asking really good questions. He's clearly interested in human phage therapy. He's quite a bright guy, Harvard educated. So these bigger companies are, are also interested in, um, in phages too. But just to finish now, I want to come back to us in Leicester and what we're doing to try to narrow this gap between um, patients trying to treat patients, uh, doctors trying to treat patients who are dying of um, antimicrobial resistant infections and my wonderful collections of phages that kill everything. So at my, my current project with UTIs, I'm working with Melissa Haynes. I don't know if, if you've come across her. She did a PhD in Leicester and then she went away and did a medical degree. And then she came back, she, she loved medicine, but she liked the research side of it. And so she, she came back and did an, um, a clinical fellowship festival and now she's got a clinical lectureship. So she's half the time on my lab and half the time actually with patients um, at mainly at the LRI where she's advising on um, AMR and uh, uh, appropriate treatment for bacterial infections. Then I work with this woman, uh, Marie Noelle Vu, who is a public health doctor. Now she's um, spent an entire research career uh, or, or career really trying to fix crumbling health structures. She's currently employed by the NHS in Lambeth to figure out which are the most common infections and what's killing what. So she brings a really interesting perspective because it's essentially unless, uh, it, unless the <laughs> antibiotics really aren't working, there's no real incentive to not to develop something else. So it's working with her that we realise actually um, UTIs are a really good thing to actually start on and try and get traction with because we know that they're, they, they're expensive, they cause a lot of misery. Um, so, and there's really not a good alternative to antibiotics. So what we did is we found, first of all, um, a good set of phages and we characterised them. Um, so, and that's one of the things that we've, um, 
really the first aim of that project. So what we want to do is try to support the introduction of phage therapy into the UK. So I said, so we did, remember I showed you this graph already, this little pie chart. Uh, we, we find phages that can target all the different types of the bacteria we're interested in. So our bacteria come from, from uh, patients at Leicester, largely who had um, urinary tract infections, and they're mainly the extended beta-lactamases uh, resistant strains, so they're, they're particularly problematic. So we searched for phages that can kill all the strains of interest. And then the second thing that Mel's been doing a lot of is really the sort of patient interfacing aspect of the work. So she's she's worked with um, patients with recurrent UTI, so sort of in a way test the water as to how acceptable phage therapy will be, but also working with different clinicians, both infectious disease clinicians and with those that are doing clinical trials on other um, um, methods of treating UTIs. Plus, we're looking, we're talking with other experts in phage therapies who, who are using phages routinely. So they have partners in, in Brussels and in Zurich, as well as Georgia, who are using phages. We can learn how exactly they're using them to, to apply that to our own work. And then we're working with our own regulatory organisation, which is MARA. Now, the third thing <laughs> that we're doing is, is doing this proof of concept model. So in order to do a clinical trial, we need to show that they're both safe and effective in, uh, in animals. So we would hope to use the phages by, to deliver the phages to the urinary tract via a catheter. So their phages will end up in the right place within the bladder. So there's a mouse catheter model that we'll use. Um, and we, we, we've already figured out the experimental procedure that we hope to do. And then we'll, we'll monitor safety by looking at the histology, um, both of the, and analyzing that, that kidney in the bladder over a period of five days. So um, following getting this data, we'll be able to have that, that uh, safety and efficacy data that will allow us to then apply to the um, NIHR to do a, a, a trial. So we're also designing that at the moment. Okay, <laughs> so I'm sorry it's quite late at night to have given you this long talk, but hopefully you've got, got an overall impression now on why it, this is such a problem and the area certainly that we're working on in, in, at Leicester to try to better understand and use phages. Um, it's a pretty exciting time to be studying phages, although they don't work in a standard way as antimicrobials, we have the tools to be able to study them. Um, I feel like we're making a lot of progress in terms of all of this knowledge, like building blocks of, of understanding their biology. And I think going forward, it's going to be critical to work with teams of um, or, or between fundamental scientists and clinical scientists and doctors on the front end who are, who are treating patients to be able to figure out how best to use phage products and which ones we need to prioritise the development of. So um, on the bottom you can see all the different people that have funded my research who I'd like to acknowledge and then I'd um, happily, I'd like to stop that I'll happily take any questions on any aspect of what I've spoken about tonight. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Klucky.